Hey, which is a very popular online website, if you don't know. I believe he's also got uh, a new book that he's promoting, which uh, sounds very interesting. I'm sure he's got a copy of it there. Um, yep. And I'm sure we'll, we'll give him a chance to, to speak on that in a minute. I'm going to turn it over to Coy now for introductions and uh, to let him give his presentation. So uh, let's all welcome. All right, guys. Uh, thank you so much, David, for joining us. Uh, like Scott said, Dave is a freelance science writer. He's also a retired U.S. Air Force and a longtime amateur astronomer. He contributes to Sky and Telescope and Universe Today, and he likes to tweet under the handle Astro Guys. Uh, he's the author of this book as well, The uh, Universe Today, Ultimate Guide to Viewing the Cosmos. And of course, his forthcoming book, The Backyard Astronomer's Field Guide, which comes out in July. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce everyone to David Dickinson. Thanks, thanks, Hoy. That was uh, it's kind of cool to see my book out there, actually, uh, out in the wild there. Um, yeah, it's, you know, I fell into science writing. I'm not a professional astronomer. I'm not uh, a trained journalist or a, cha a trained writer. I'm a science teacher and retired enlisted military. And I just started a blog about 15 years ago. And it just kind of grew into something more than just me writing my random, like, here's what I'm observing, here's what I'm doing. Uh, going to NASA, NASA tweet ups and watching launches. And, and then uh, once I got on board with Universe Today, Fraser Kane over there, he's really grown a great family of astronomers and science communicators from professional astronomers to uh, that's, I think his real superpower is just gathering together all these people that have all these specialized fields of knowledge and things. It's, the thing I've always been into is just observational astronomy. And again, like I said, I've never taken a class in astronomy. I've just read a lot and over 40 years dabbled in anything from astrophotography to solar observing, planetary observing, variable star observing, any little niche in there. I'm kind of more of an observer of opportunity. So if I'm somewhere where the skies are super dark, I'll go after deep sky objects. If I'm observing from downtown Norfolk in my limiting magnitude is plus three, I'll probably be watching planetary objects, double stars, things like that. But uh, yeah, the, the first book, I always call it that I've actually done two and a half books because we also did for Universe Today a PDF that was uh, a guide to astronomy in 2017 because we wanted to do the year and everything that was going on in 2017 and we wanted to of course hit that eclipse and get it in there. Uh, that was up there for free as a PDF. So this, this one, of course, is my first published book. And they say when you do your first book, you basically want to write it as if you're not going to do a second. So I dumped everything into astronomy in my brain that I could fit, that the publisher would allow me to fit in 200 pages uh, in this book. And we tried to get as many astrophotographers in here um, to contribute images. Now, what we had been aiming at didn't quite come along in this book is Frazier's old wanted to do a book where the simple question that I wrote the second book off is what's in the night sky tonight? What can I see in the night sky tonight? If I have no other way to, so the other one we kind of took a different tact with and we did star maps and I wanted it to be just a star party in a book, use it in the field, use it like you've got the, the sky month by month, Northern hemisphere, Southern hemisphere. So you start, it starts in very basically the usual things you have to cover. What is right ascension? What is declination? How do you find your direction in the sky? The hemisphere of the sky, how does altiazimuth work and things like that. But then we go month by month and I tried to throw in more naked eye, like, okay, this is the direction you're looking in the summer. You're looking out at the plane of the galaxy in the springtime. You're looking out away. So you see the, the Virgo clusters and things like that in Northern hemisphere. And I tried to work in some more mythology. We didn't get to do that. So stories in the sky. I really tried to make them. Uh, there's been an argument to be said that uh, astronomical lore is very Eurocentric. So we tried to, especially when we get into Southern hemisphere astronomy, I learned a lot actually to dig into some of the myths and lore of the Southern Hemisphere and those, those particular tales and, and things. Now, the second half, we broke down everything into, and I made these maps too, and that was an eye crossing uh, thing <laughs> all on its own. We broke down the sky by sections, 20 sections from Northern to Southern, 
this part we went down through and did, again, we did uh, black stars on white background. You can use it with a red flashlight. I was, uh, the, the early test runs of this book, I was showing them to people in star parties saying, is this legible? Do you understand? Uh, going in the bathroom with the lights out, trying to see like if I could see this stuff with the red light, you know, some things I've seen star maps before where they put um, like a lot of bluish color things will disappear under a red light. So uh, even professionally done maps aren't legible when you're trying to read them at night under a red light. This all uses basically star hopping. You know, there's uh, the, the Telerad finder here. So you've got a five degree Telerad field of view on the same field. Uh, we, we limited the top objects. You might remember, and this is almost mythical among astronomers, another really good classic that was out there from uh, the 1960s, Burnham's Celestial Handbook. I kind of wanted the spirit of this. However, in a one volume guide, Burnham's never did a lot of maps. Burnham's was a lot of uh, text. Uh, and and it, it's used, it uses 1950 coordinates, which I think is just amazing that there's still something out there in print that's using that for uh, star maps. So I kind of wanted the spirit of something like that in just a stripped down field guide that you can use out in, um, you know, I've taken it out a few times and used it and showed it to other astronomers, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, this is kind of like the chapter four and five in the first book expanded into a book because we really could only do best objects. I limited everything down to 10th magnitude except for some challenge objects we put in there because otherwise, and again, and even then limiting down to 10th magnitude, which gets you down to, Messer objects, it's all deep sky, incidentally. This one um, doesn't cover planets, or we did that in the first book. We do planetary astronomy, lunar astronomy, top objects, things like that. This is top deep sky objects, down to 10th magnitude. That gets you Messer objects, bright NGCs, uh, some IC objects. And there were a few challenge objects we put in there, like how to find one of the brighter quasars in the sky. That's 13th magnitude. Um, some of the more interesting variable stars and double stars. Double stars, I always think, are kind of neat. And it's essentially a star party in a book. And, you know, again, it's a labor of love, but. I think I'm still on. <laughs> Yeah, okay. you're yeah, you can be. Okay. You're still on. Yeah. But uh that's the uh that's the book and um writing it, you know, I did I did these maps off Stellarium, the templates, and then I put them in Adobe Illustrator to make them. And I'll tell you, map map making is something I have a friend of mine that does, and I'll plug his book real quick because he just sent me this. Uh beautiful book. He, he is an actual map maker per se, Michael Zeiler in Santa Fe. And he did the Atlas of Solar Eclipses uh, up through 2045. And, but I'm always amazed at the work he does. I mean, this, this is a pretty amazing book. He covered every single solar eclipse up through. Um, and I tell you that making a book and doing the mapping part of it and making sure in Adobe Illustrator that's all lined up. And I, this was a little bit of a compromise, but it came out good. Um, I originally wanted these to be full page and the publisher was like, well, of course we have the almighty page count where it's like, we can either have, because when you're doing 20 of these 24 sky maps to make them all full page, that would have ate, eaten up way too much space for the text. So, but I think these came out good. They're legible. I think if they're half page, well, actually a little more than half page, you've got everything in there. So it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, I'm ha it was a little bit of an experiment, but it's uh, this comes out July 21st and we did it. We pushed to have it, me and Fraser to have it spiral bound uh, might seem like a little, a minor thing, but again, and of course that pushes up the publishing costs a little bit too. But uh, to have it spiral bound like this when you're observing in the field, everything in this was done with the idea 
of you're going to use this at the eyepiece at the telescope. So this wasn't as much of a coffee table book as this book was. This was a good coffee table book, not the greatest to use out in the field. Uh, it's a good uh, primer to amateur astronomy. Uh, we broke down a lot of basic astrophotography in this one. Astrophotography, I, I had to be, because that could be a book as well. I had to be limited to getting people into basic uh, deep sky astrophotography, image stacking and stuff like that, because that is usually the biggest hurdle. I know everybody that going from shooting the moon and doing really basic, uh, you know, DSLR and the tripod and the Milky Way exposures and stuff you can do easily. Getting from there to starting doing basic deep sky stuff is the biggest hurdle I see that most people are. I dabble in that myself. It's uh, not something I know some some really like Alan Dyer and some really amazing astrophotographers worldwide that do some things I'm in awe of or Corey Schmidt down in South Africa. But that's uh, that was the first book. Um, well, so, question, yeah. Dave. Yeah, go ahead. Where, where are these books available? Uh, they're on Amazon. They're up for pre-order. The uh, uh, the first one and the second one are both up there uh, on my author page and up there for pre-order. So, okay. Are they published yet? This one is. This one is from two years ago. This one is out there and published. And this one comes out July twenty-first. But I've seen the. Uh, I've got the pre-link uh, out there is already up there for order, so. Okay, thank you. The cover is by an uh, astrophotographer in South uh, America too, actually. This this took a little bit of haggling to get the right cover on it. It's it's interesting, you know, they say never judge a book by its cover, but I've learned now that I've done a couple books, you'll go back and forth with your publisher on the cover for 90% of, of like most, anything between the pages, they were pretty much happy with what I did, but the cover, they were really picky on uh, how that, that's, it was kind of an interesting process. I'm also in, um, well, I have it here. I have an article, me and Corey Schmidt, in the March edition of Sky and Telescope of getting your, uh, it came from a funny story when I was in Morocco, I travel and do astronomy sometime, of getting your telescope from here to there. Ironic, it came out in March now that everybody's locked down and nobody can travel, but, um, I have a little five inch Maksudov scope that customs was uh, very interested in going to Morocco, almost to the point that they were going to confiscate it. And it took a little bit of um, debating in what little French, French and Arabic is the, uh, is the primary language there. Uh, and I actually had to go search out a customs official and uh, try to explain to them that it wasn't a military device or it wasn't you know, anything nefarious. They did let me keep my telescope, uh, but it kind of made me think, you know, uh, this actually, I started talking to people on Twitter, other amateur astronomers about this, and they started saying, well, there's uh, a lot of people that also have had problems, usually traveling to total solar eclipses that have had problems with TSA or problems with their gear. And I was like, I think there's an article here. So I did a little bit of research in, um, you know, bringing in a lot of photographic equipment because I th got the thinking it's like you know news crews probably go through the same thing so they got to bring cameras and lenses and all this gear and I noticed they were really interested to know if I had a drone which I didn't and it turns out in Morocco uh, drones aren't legal there so uh, that's another thing that maybe a lot of people that are are gearheads and, and technically inclined would be traveling with so I did a whole article researched it up a little bit like where you can find all the information for all these different countries and just advice for how to get your stuff through customs. So, so yeah, it was uh, interesting. It came out in March, like I said, unfortunately, that, uh, <laughs> that everybody's locked down now. But um, any questions, anybody? Well, I was uh, curious about your thoughts on the Vestalina telescope. I've seen you post in some interesting pictures. I uh, hope you talk about that a little bit. Which one? The Stellina. Oh, Stellina. Yes, I was using that. The uh, I got I'm that for the review those. copy. It's it's an interesting. I don't know if I would pay four thousand dollars for one. I would maybe pay. It's three now. It's three now. Okay. Yeah. I think it's more. Still in the a little range. high, right? I think I think it's more in the range of two. I would start considering one, but uh, it's uh yeah. I I reviewed it for Universe today, and I put one through its paces and. 
I was impressed what I could do on the rooftop here, uh, where I'm primarily observing uh, from with lockdown is you can't really, most of the campsites are closed here. I'm in Virginia, Norfolk. And so I go up to the, our apartment has an open rooftop parking garage. Again, pretty light polluted, but it's, uh, you find a little dark corner away from the street lights there a little bit. And uh, I was able to do uh, brighter messier objects with it on the rooftop, uh, like M51, uh, M35. It's interesting how it works. There's no eyepiece. It just, you, you hook it up to an app on your phone. And when I first saw one and my wife said the same thing, she's like, that's a telescope. I'm like, it doesn't even look like a telescope because it's folded up. I wish I had it here. I, I could, I could put it through a brief demonstration. It, uh, it was, I think they need to open up and they're starting to do this a little more, their software, um, for open source and just letting, it was interesting. Uh, they had an update that allowed the users, which seems like a really basic thing to just aim at a particular right ascension declination that isn't one of their set objects. The way the original app was, is that it gave you a tour of the night sky. And I think I kind of felt like you're playing with something that's a little more set where it's telling you what, I was like, well, what if there was a bright comet? Like, which um, there was actually while I was reviewing it and they, they said, oh, there's an update for it. Now you can push it at a, a set right ascension declination. Uh, so comet T2 pan stars is pretty, it's binocular bright. So I managed to get some images of that uh, with that update to be able to, but I thought that's kind of a big oversight to, to not allow. Uh, it, it didn't seem like they were giving the users a lot of control to do those sorts of things. But I, I could see some interesting uses for it uh, as far as um, just doing those kind of, uh, it does, it does everything for you out of the box. And that's another thing I told the wife that it's like, this is kind of a plus for every telescope I've owned. Usually there's some troubleshooting. There's some calling the manufacturer. There's some saying, Hey, this is pointing at the ground and not where I want it to point at. Or the, this one, I will say for you, you get what you pay, you pay for, for that much money that it literally is take it out of the box, set it on its little chicken foot tripod, download the app to your phone, bond the, the app to the device, and it, it goes through it. You turn it on, it does the GPS, it does the image stacking. It almost, I liken it if learning how to use a telescope is to uh, like learning how to play a piano. This is like playing a player piano where you just wind it up and it goes. And the operator is just like, okay, that's, you know, I flip the switch and it's doing what it does. So it almost puts me out of a job in that, it is good that it gets through that process of, I'm amazed that GPS and things are that accurate now that finding things and aligning things, it, it, it's right dead on. Because I know some of the early go-to scopes I used uh, back from the 90s, you were kind of, you would line them up and you'd do the star alignment and then you'd kind of still have to spiral around. It would get you maybe within half a degree or a degree to, to, to where the object was. So uh, it's amazing that the technology's come that far where it's really, within it's pointing you within a few arc seconds of where it needs to be but the image quality is acceptable or it it is like i said well it's a it's it's a raw image uh, and you can download them as raw files so if you wanted to do and you can enhance or stack them as well right yeah this does automatically its own stacking it, it does its own stacking for what you would want to do just for like a, a quick uh, share on Instagram or something like that right off your phone. You can also, I usually, when I was using it, you, you can plug a USB drive into it and the raw files will actually download as you're shooting automatically. Uh -huh. So if you wanted to do uh, any more advanced uh, stacking and, and framing, I never get it out to a dark site, which is what I would have liked to have done, but the, the, the lockdown happened right as that, uh, as, as I got it to review, but it's a, uh, no, I was impressed that it actually worked because it, again, like I said, I, every other telescope I've had, I've, I've kind of, especially with go-to systems, I've never had one that was even the early GPS ones that were really super precise. Well, and I think for those, I mean, for me, there are two things. I'm a lazy astronomer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, know, I am too. It's not so much as I mean lazy. It's just, I have a C11 and it, it's, it's a, great scope but it's it's a lot to carry around it's quite yeah. heavy um and i don't like the patience it would take to uh photoshop or or stack these images over hours of time of collecting light and 
processing yeah. it. So for someone like me, it, it makes sense almost. So one day you guys will probably see me walk in with it at a meeting. I don't know. I'm pretty close, but I haven't pulled the trigger. But I'm like you, threes. If it was four, I definitely wouldn't have done it. Three, I'm still like, okay, maybe I'll have a few cocktails and do that. But <laughs> right off the top, it's hard to, to put that kind of money into it, thinking what else you could do with it. But if it, I just, I thank you for your comments because I basically wanted to speak to someone who's actually used it. Yeah. And is it, you know, is it, if I, you pay $3,000, if you have it, you get what you pay for. If it's not yeah. an inconvenience to buy it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting to, uh, I was, I could see something like this in a, a mini remote observatory if somebody wanted to, just if you had power out to it. Uh, using it with the phone anyway, I noticed the Wi Fi. Um, you you can't uh you're either wi-fi to the telescope or you're wi-fi to your like your mobile network so uh it, you have to shut that off like your your external mobile network to to talk with the phone to the telescope so and the only thing i'm kind of a little concerned with but maybe they'll keep up with the software it's like if you you know i have an older c8 i just got rid of that was 20 years old you know it still works and everything is fine on it however since this works off the Android operating system or the Apple operating system, you're paying $3,000. Like, are we still going to be using these same operating systems in 10 years or is this going to be a brick? So I'm kind of, I would be kind of concerned that it, uh, probably what I would do if I had one for real is maybe I, I have an older uh, Galaxy S6 that we don't use. I would probably dedicate that to the telescope and just use that to control the scope and, you know, uh, it, it would probably work as long as that phone like and I think it'd be, later. <laughs> be great for some of our outreach I think it would re be really good for that yeah. actually I, I want you know, to kids want to see the things program. they see in a magazine you know what I mean yeah so if you just a kid just looks through it and you think they're gonna be impressed kids are you know blatantly honest they're like well yeah. I don't see anything or that doesn't look like anything so no it, you you could this see seems like, like on, something the kids or someone who would you know it's uh the stacking process is slow i remember the manufacturer was telling me in the first few images they're like well you, you need to leave it on the images longer so they build up a better i was like well that's so uh generally for most ngc's or uh messier objects they were recommending about 30 minutes on an object so i would do one or two a night and i put it up there so at a star party you couldn't really be hopping around to a lot of different targets but um you could get an acceptable image i thought after 10 minutes uh, aimed at it. It was very um, finicky about uh, if, if it was twilight, the scope just refused to turn on. It's like it knew the sky was too bright. What it does is when it turns on, it starts figuring out where it is. It starts aiming at different parts of the sky on its own. Uh, it's kind of interesting to watch it do it. And it just starts trying to compare star fields, I think, to get a really fine uh, alignment on its position from its yeah, GPS. Like the star sense does that too. Yeah, I haven't played with one of those, but I've seen that. But it's, uh, I, I found the first night, I had to wait about half an hour because it was, and it was deep twilight, but it wants it like absolutely dark twilight before it will start operating, so. There's some other companies that have, there's, um, I think there's one called the EV Scope, I believe. I forget who makes it. And there's another Kickstarter, Hayuni. It's like a Japanese company that built uh, it's a, built around a six inch uh, reflector. This one, Stalina, is an 80 millimeter refractor that's built into it. But again, when you first see it, it just looks like a, somebody told me if they played video games uh, that it looks like a gun from the video game portal. Uh, I've heard that more than once. So I, I, apparently there is something in the video game that looks exactly like this. So. Yeah, it was a cool little piece of technology to play with. But I, I, I noticed on Instagram, I kind of got a mix. That's the high uni. Yeah. The, the high uni. I haven't played with that. It's oh, it's this a, is a, the portal. Beautiful gold turret, by the way. This is a, it's a little broken thing. They used to sell this from Think Geek. Unfortunately, this doesn't work anymore. It's a it's a little plush thing. Oh, cool. Um, but yeah, it does. That does look a little bit like stuff. Like yeah, it, it's 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 one of those things everybody has always said. But yeah, the the Selena is really really a cool concept in terms of a, a pickup plug and play. 
but it looks like it's basically the the best thing about it is that it's got the ever it's an all-in-one package i think you could probably hobble together the same material um from various other sources uh grab yeah. a, a, a you know a little uh what do they call them uh asi air and a couple of asi cameras get their plate solving and their live stacking going and this uh, is the high uni one i just pulled it up oh yeah yeah, it, yeah. Look, it looks a little more like your prototypical telescope they kicked yeah, that one out. It out. but the, the point being is that by the time you buy everything that you need in order to get it up and running it's comparable in price to the the, the stellina so this yeah. if you're just starting off i think the and don't have any equipment already, the Stellina is very, very enticing, especially for its portability. Um, yeah. So it, it, it's a, an interesting little thing that you can- I'm just wondering if the larger aperture, like on the high anything might make it, does it make that much of a the, difference? I wouldn't worry about the larger apertures usually come with a longer focal length. Um, so that makes right. any, doing any of your photography a lot more complicated. The 80 millimeter will pretty much show you most of the sky um, very, very well. Um, so I, I think 80 millers, that's, that's a beautiful place to begin with. And that's the, the target audience, the Stellina, um, so at least you, in my opinion. You, Unistellar does the EV scope. I haven't seen one of those up close. That's a similar computerized scope. And it's kind of interesting that they want to do some actual science. And I, I kind of was thinking of that with the Stellina too, that if you, if you put this in the hands of, of networked observers, you could do like asteroid occultations or variable star monitoring or hunt for comets. Like you could have these out there just automatically photographing the sky, looking for things. So there, there could be, I think they're trying to do something like that where there, there's EV scope networks kind of where they do these sorts of, and you can do, the moon looks pretty acceptable through it. it seems weird to aim a $4,000 telescope at the moon, but uh, uh, it's not- I do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's not built for planetary. Unfortunately. Uh, it's it's got a very true. wide field of view, so when you you can aim it at the planets, but it's not going to give you anything really. It, it's the field of view is kind of set like I think it was. It's about as wide as a full moon on its field of view. It would be interesting to watch a total lunar eclipse through it. I think if you were doing anything with it with the moon, because you could get these images live on the phone. Well, I kind of like what you said that I never thought about having networked scopes, you know, for that sort of survey. You know, you think about yeah. citizen science and where all this is going, you know, you, you think about what work they could do. I mean, I see the work that Corey does, Corey Schmitz yep. does. I see Damien Peach's work and I see what Fraser does from a remote location. You know, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you know, what's yeah. next? Where are we, you know, where are we going? Well, I know there's always been kind of an arms race with professional and amateur astronomers. Like I notice a lot more of your comets that are discovered now all have automated, they're all Panstars or Atlas or Comet uh, like Lemon, like from the Mount Lemon Sky Survey. It's uh, you're not seeing a lot of comets discovered by amateurs anymore, which is kind of a shame. But I think, uh, you know, if you've got these kind of automated and the, the game is about to, to go up another level because things like the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, that's coming online, I believe, 2021, 2022, that's going to see first light. Those things are going to be photographing the sky down to like ludicrous magnitude, like, like plus 25, plus 27, like three times a night. So those are expected to probably find a lot more asteroids and comets. But, you know, a lot of amateurs are going to be, that's going to be a lot of information and data out there that professionals aren't going to be able to sift through. That's like SOHO. A lot of amateurs find comets just sifting through data, looking at uh, for sun grazing comets. That's been for about 20 years now. SOHO has been up there. And it's amazing. I was talking to Carl Badams about that. And he's like, you know, before SOHO even launched, its job wasn't even to find sun grazing comets, was to observe the sun but the chronographs they have staring at the sun with this blocked out disc, uh, just by default, they see a lot of sun grazing comets. I didn't realize he said before the nineties, there was less than a dozen sun grazing comets that ever been discovered or observed. And Soho sees them almost every day now, like, or a couple of weeks. So I think a lot of that kind of scientific research with amateurs, there's gonna be this glut of data out there generated by all these new surveys and amateurs are going to probably play a role just sifting through them looking for um, anything from transiting exoplanets to variable stars to comets to asteroids to 
it's it's going to you know a lot less discoveries are going to be made at the eyepiece in the backyard although you know it's still fun to do that sort of thing all right we can open it up to some questions if anybody's got one i know some people have already chimed in um, uh, you were talking about the southern constellations in your book. I was wondering if your book was listing the uh, the constellations as they're presented in the southern hemisphere or using the modern uh, southern constellations that we had actually, you know, put together back in the 19th century or whatever. It's it's listed by the, the IAU uh, designated okay. 1922 constellations. We do talk about some of the constellations that were used by but that were, and I even talk about in, even in the West, there, there were pre-constellations and obsolete. Uh, one good example is the, the mural quadrant that they named the Quadranid Meteors after. That's a defunct constellation. And that's a whole, I've written a little bit about, uh, it's a whole fascinating field of research in these constellations. The constellations we have now were codified in 1922. So we're almost coming up on the century on that too, for the International Astronomical Union. Uh, one thing I think was interesting in the southern constellations, uh, and this came up in research, is that the Inca, actually, their constellations were parts of the Milky Way, which is right overhead, that are shadow outlines. So those are dark, we know those are dark lanes and, and uh, places where there's gas and dusk obscuring parts of the Milky Way that you can't see. But their constellations actually were part of those negative spaces there that are outlines where you can't see anything, but they're very prominent down in South America. So we, uh, we tried to include a little discussion on those sorts of things. And again, a book on mythology, uh, I had to reference several good sized books on mythology to kind of pull, I kind of pulled some of the best of the best. You know, when you're doing a star party at night, it's always fun to pull in just some of the drama and the art in the sky as well. You know, that, that kind of can interest people rather than just lists of globular clusters or things like that. So, you know, it's a- uh, Not everybody kind of likes tables. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, that was great. I, it, that particularly sparked my mind because I remember hearing, just listening to some podcast or another at some point was talking about one of the, the Southern Hemisphere constellations and one of their lures seem to include this epic battle which would have there were someone's doing stellar archaeology and they believe that they were actually attributing a supernova into the stories that was read into one of these uh, southern constellations i wonder or, if that was the one in vela i think i might i don't know, remember if i put that in there or not but i think i did come across that there was something like that i don't know uh, a it, lot of things get edited out but i that sounds familiar yeah, but but I mean, it occurred to me that uh, telling that story using you know the the northern constellation the northern terms for the southern constellations just wouldn't have been the same story. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was curious about that, but uh, so it's, it, it would be interesting to see a, a reconstructed sky chart using a purely native uh, designations for the constellations like pre 19th century constellations you, you know uh, stellarium does have a setting if you're familiar with that the free planetarium software um, stellarium if you go into it there are settings for alternate um, constellation mythologies that's kind of fascinating oh well I, I haven't ever really dug enough with stellarium i got sucked into the uh, the sky safari suites um yeah. and, and but yeah the, the, there's i'm envisioning a time in the near future due to various things that is going to necessitate my becoming more familiar with Stellarium. So it's cool to know. Um, that, yeah, Stellarium is yeah. a great open free resource. Yeah. Um, and, I've, I've, and yeah, I've got it on the, this computer. I just... You can do the, the Japanese moon houses, like, because they're the way they had the Zodiac marked off, the, the Chinese uh, Zodiac, you, you can it's it's interesting and I actually had to dig in a little bit to see where they're sourcing this stuff from to kind of do my own research. To, well, I, I really, I tried to make a conscious effort, like I said, to, we told the stories of, of Orion the Hunter and, and the ones were, the, the, the mandatory ones we're all familiar with, but I tried to get in there and get some, pull out some maybe not so known stories. Yeah, I, I like that. that that's really kind of cool. It, it's the goes to speaking more about how the, the sky is everyone's heritage. And we, we keep on saying that more and more, especially as we're getting more and more of these satellites going up and more and more light pollution. 
Um, and it's really nice to say it really is everyone's heritage. Everyone's got a story and everyone is represented yeah, no, differently. The, the, the well, the mythology in general, it's kind of, I think you're looking back kind of what their hopes and dreams. It's kind of where an older culture can speak. I, I mean, it's kind of the equivalent of somebody were to watch like our modern movies and things like that. And it would kind of like you would see kind of like, okay, this, this is really more than just knowing dates and terms and things. This is actually how people fought in that time frame, you know? Yeah. Or trying to, to recreate a story behind an ancient Roman mural or something like that without yeah. knowing anything. Um, so it, it is really kind of cool just to, to see how people read themselves into the, uh, so that they get to be like ink blots in a way. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. And it's, and, and it was, it was something I didn't get to touch on in the first book. Again, it's, it's, uh, you're always kind of pushing against that page count. So it's, uh, and it's like that when you're even writing a news article or blogging, you go from, I don't know what I'm going to write about this to, I have too much to write about. It's like, there's all these different things about this subject and they're all important and they're all fascinating. <laughs> so. Well, all right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, anybody else has got questions? Uh, Susan here uh, has wondered if you ever incorporate Native American lore into your stories for Northern Hemisphere constellations. Yes, there... The Smithsonian had an exhibit and she had read about it on NPR, she was saying. Yes, there, there is some of the, I know we did some of the stories on the, the Milky Way. Of course, everybody see, saw the Milky Way and saw their own things into it. But we did work some Native American lore in there, I know from, and I think there's, there, there was one Inuit story that we talked about that was uh, that tied in with the Northern Lights and things in uh, some of the constellations. Oh yeah, there, there was one, there's a creation myth. I do remember this too, that it was a Cherokee creation myth that actually came up and talked about why there were stars in the sky. And we actually worked on in that one a little bit about why, and it was interesting that I never had heard this one before. And it's, again, I was like, oh, I gotta include that one. It's like, they were talking about why the stars are scattered in a random pattern. And it's, I just thought it was interesting that there was a culture out there, it was talking about how um, originally the creator had put the stars like as like flowers in the sky. And however, it was the coyote that took the last of the flowers and scattered them. And I just thought it was interesting that someone would have a myth that no one else, no other culture explains why they're just randomly strewn in the sky, apparently. So I just thought that was kind of an interesting little tie in there. So yeah, there's a few. Great. Anybody else got questions, comments, concerns, criticisms? Not the criticisms. We don't like the criticisms. <laughs> oh, I know where all but the errors are in the book. If you if you know some if you see an error in the book, let me. I, I'll tell you this too. I found out writing a book. Every and you get editor brain. So when I read other books now, every book has some errors in it. And uh, I, I've already luckily the first thing when you're an author and you get the book for the first time, they got my name right. They got the cover right. So uh, I'm going through and kind of combing out right now the hard task of looking through and making sure it's, it's uh, but you know, if, if somebody comes up to me and says, you got this magnitude wrong on page 93, I'll just be happy that you read to page 93. I'm really glad that you did and, and thank you. I actually well, was... just pre-ordered your book. Okay. And as an FYI, it's under thank David you. Dickinson. And, yeah. uh, your your up here is Dave. So I first did Dave, but oh, okay. then then it was David Dickinson. But I just pre-ordered it. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. There's another David Dickinson in the UK right. that's an antiques. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't quite own my name on the internet. Um, a, I was I was joked that if I invent time travel, I'll go back and tell my parents <laughs> that there's going to be Google in the future, and you need to name me something that I'll be able to easily dominate my name on on the search but but you know Fraser Kane has the same problem so well that I was you were talking about the uh uh the uh, list of errata and I remembered that was the uh the when I got my 
moon atlas uh, last year that was the the there was a, an entire page and i think another extra page on uh, just strange errors in the book that needed to be corrected. Oh, interesting. Fact, well, they, yeah. they, they must have got that in in time. Well, you know, like I said, when you, <laughs> when you get editor brain, I look back through Burnham's, it's a wonderful resource, but I find things that are wrong in here. Um, uh, and, and oddly enough, if anybody's interested in checking out Burnham's handbook and doesn't have a copy, we've got a copy at the, uh, the observatory that is, uh, you can go and check out if you'd like. Um, you got it's, it. it, it it's like very few star charts. He did mostly like close in, um, like finder charts. Um, and it's written in a very basic, again, if you love tables, it's got a lot of tables of objects, but it's very exhaustive and it's, uh, it had to have taken him decades to write. Um, but it's, uh, it's a wealth of, the coordinates are a little off now with proper motion because his coordinates were 1950s coordinates. There's another, author pair of authors that's doing annals of the night sky that's kind of in work right. right now that that's a very large um that's very exhaustive though and a little little technical on the astrophysics side i tried to this one i did a very basic again star party asked we did astrophysics 101 you know what are stars uh how do supernovae work how the lives of stars we did the headspring russell diagram um so we uh we tried to stick to what you would tell people at a star party. Here's the diagram of the galaxy. So we, you know what you're talking about when you're looking at different angles. Here's the basic, the classic tuning fork uh, pattern. So different galaxies from ellipticals to barred spirals and things like that. So to, to give you what, what you would do at a star party to tell people like some astrophysical description of what you're looking at. It looks pretty good. Uh, thank you very much for coming and thank sharing you. your, your information with us. Uh, do we have anybody else that wanted to, to speak with you or uh, have a comment or question? Or anybody, anybody excited about Starlink? <laughs> that, always, that always gets a room going, I know, at Star Party. So. I, yeah. I've been, tra I've been tracking Starlinks when I can. Um, I haven't seen any from this launch yet, but it's... we had an advisory that uh, the, a bunch of Starlinks were going to be passing over a couple of days ago. And it was so early in the evening that I thought, well, you know, all these things, you're just never going to see any. It's going to still be dusk out. So I, I went out just to, to check and see. And sure enough, one of them just bright as day flies right over. So yeah. Yeah. I've seen some, some per. Oh, I saw a question pop up. I didn't read it. Oh, that was just uh, Scott is uh, one of our astrophotographers, and uh, he was comment about how how we're look how much we're looking forward to the Starlinks being fully deployed. Um, in, in, in <laughs> we're all just thrilled about it. <laughs> oh yeah, especially when they've been dimmed down to what to seventh magnitude. Yeah, it's just below yeah. visual threshold for the for anybody. Well, you know, that have we an we were just talking about the the large synoptic survey telescope going online, and that's something they're going to have to deal with. They they go down again to like ludicrous magnitude, like plus plus twenty five and things like that. Uh, yeah, when when you were talking about how they'd be finding a lot of comets, the my first snide thought was, well, they're going to find a lot of star links first. But, <laughs> I, 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 but yeah, you know, five it, days it, ago. It says they launched 60 five days ago. Yes, there was. I haven't seen any from that. I, I do satellite tracking is just kind of fun. I, I know some guys uh, like Marco Langbroek over in the Netherlands that are pretty hardcore satellite trackers that, uh, you know, they're, and we're all looking and just, that's what's kind of fun with Twitter, actually, for doing social media. Those, those things, we can kind of talk about what are they seeing over in the UK? What are we seeing here? We can do those kind of discussions real time. Uh, oh, it amazes it amazes me in the UK too. It's like they don't they barely don't have a space program, and yet they're fascinated with space uh, flight. Just you know, when we talk about oh, there's going to be an international space station pass, they're they're all fascinated with that. Well, I, I like to go out there and wave at the the astronauts as they yeah. pass over, uh, just just in case. Um, but uh, to, it, I hear it's lonely up there. I, I talked to one <laughs> of the, the the astronauts that came to. Space that was on the station came in to speak at one of the uh, the functions of the local university mentioned that uh, she made her husband go out and like look at the yeah. space station at every pass when they pass, except for one where he missed 
and I, I'm pretty sure that didn't include daylight passes, but you know, that whatever. There, is. there was an amateur club, and I think this article is still on Sky and Telescope about a decade ago. Um, this is when uh, Don Pettit, who was also an amateur astronomy, was uh, amateur astronomer, was on the space station. They did an experiment with, I think it was a one watt laser that they aimed it at the station, which is, is quite a powerful laser actually. Uh, and they actually did an experiment to see if he could see it at twilight. Uh, and he could from the station that they were shining it at the station. Like, I wow. think they had a, they had several, like they had some big spotlights and they were using big pieces of plywood to kind of try to blink with spotlights. And they also were shining a pair of one watt lasers at the station in twilight, which is optimal and just, just kind of a little test condition thing. But it was, uh, it's kind of interesting that they actually could see that from space. I think they've got a telescope up there if they really wanted to try to, to find features on Earth, but I think it'd be easier to find features on Earth from Earth, uh, so they, they may be a, they, may be they a do, better use. You know, they do have a telescope up there. Yeah, but I, I, I think they'd, I, if I had one, I think I'd rather look out if it was pointed in the right direction. Um, oh, funny. Yeah, and you know, um, there's been some discussion. The, the space station won't be there forever. It's, uh, it's getting older. Um, and it's all cobbled together from various modules from different countries. It's been up there for, we've had a human presence in space for 20 years now. Probably, uh, probably within a decade, it's going to end its, they'll, they'll purposely deorbit it into uh, the, the remote Point Nemo down in the South Pacific. Uh, so, of course, it's going to be the hugest thing that's ever re-entered, but... Um, <laughs> They'll well, keep they can, it going as long as they can, but I think I, I'm going to guess within a decade, by 2030 or so, it will probably end its life. Well, they could, I think they could probably get a take off a module at a time the same way they, they put it up there if they wanted to. But I, I have no I idea know. if they were going to try and deorbit it or just push it out into to a graveyard orbit. Um, but I guess it's too big for that. I have no it's idea. It's in low Earth orbit too, yeah. I think that yeah. would be too difficult because they have to boost it periodically so it won't re-enter. Well, like they, they use... They'd have to boost. They'd have to boost it up to at least 400 more miles further up out of the low Earth orbit now to get it up into a parking orbit. And if yeah. only we knew somebody that could actually get a rocket up there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know the, the the Russians have said if we don't want it, they would, and and they're pretty resourceful about uh, making things work out of just failing wire and duct tape. So uh, they they've said that they they would try to keep it going if. Uh, it's probably got about another, I would say another decade or so. Uh, it'd be nice, but uh, yeah, it, it's generally the thought, God, my thought has always been it took them so long to build the thing that it, it seems did. like it, it just got finished. Actually, I think they just finished putting in a science rack that was 20 years overdue for being in, in, put in there, or 10 years oh, yeah. overdue. Um, so I, I think it, it's been small part it's still under construction um and it's amazing like to look at the wikipedia for science done <laughs> aboard the uh, international space station and it's huge like anything from uh astrophysics to earth observation to human physiology to medicine to metallurgy to like studying you know just how things work in zero g um it, it's been an amazing platform for uh, science it, it really has. It, it, it's, and it's cool. And, and uh, like I said, you go out there on any given night if it's passing overhead and wave at them. And it, well, by the time it's overhead, chances are they're having dinner and going to sleep. Um, yeah. But uh, at the same time, people are out there working, going to, you know, getting up and doing the, the daily commute and slogging off and I'm, I'm real routinely, I've dabbled in this a little bit, but I'm routinely amazed with the images that ground observers can do by tracking the International Space Station. Um, I, I, I always thought that was a joke until they started coming by, because I, I mean, I, just to, to even look at it through a, a, a daub, I know it moves too fast for most of the, the, the computer yeah. scopes that I've got, but uh, uh, one of our uh, guys at the observatory used to do it as a parlor trick when it was flying over he would take the daub and sure enough you could actually get lattice work out of the, the station and things <laughs> it, like that. You know with, with binoculars depending on how it's oriented of course I have a pair of uh, Canon uh, image stabilized binoculars so that gives me a little bit of an advantage but uh, I can see a little bit of hints of structure depending on uh, it can look either like um, a little boxy shape 
or maybe a, a close, close double star, or if it's face on, I have seen the ISS look kind of like a mini Star Wars TIE fighter, like very teeny, teeny. If this, when it's straight overhead, because it's closer, and wow. if the conditions are just right, it looks just, because it's about the same angular size as Saturn. So about in that 40 arc second or so, 30, 40 arc seconds. I've, I've, I've seen the, the lattice thing before, which is really, really cool, that little TIE fighter effect. But uh, yeah, the, the, somebody was uh, going around really flexing his skill earlier this week with a, a he had, it was a manual scope on, and his, you know, just a like portable camera, um, but was actually managing to point out the, the various, uh, the Cygnus That's ship attached to the, the, the ISS. And I thought that was, that was pretty impressive. I have no idea. 20 arc seconds. Okay. 20. Yeah. He was, it was, he was, it, it's somewhere out there on the for it, and, uh, but it was, Wow, some guys are just super dedicated. And yeah, uh, that's that's I, I use a very primitive method when I've imaged it too. It's literally I, I used to have a C8 and I would just be running video. You'd find something static like Venus, so you could get the contrast and the focusing right. Because when yeah. the pass comes, you just want to have it ready. So you just turn the video on, and then you aim at the ISS and you just try to track it is through the finder scope. So when you watch the video back, it's like nothing, nothing. Oh, there it goes, like nothing, nothing. Oh, there it is again. Like, yeah. and you could get enough little frames of it hopping through that you would you would be able to get something usable. And uh, there is a, a small community in the, the astrophotography community too that really enjoys watching the uh, the space station do a solar or lunar transit. And there are websites yeah. that'll tell you the the exact place and time to be to set it up. And at that point, you just set the scope on the sun or the moon, and you wait for it to pass and through. And you're then using you, the am, the ambush method. That's the easy yeah. way. It's like that's you just the, aim the, at a target and wait for it to go by. That that's the only way I could think to do it. Is like I just yeah. have to to sit around and wait for it to show up. I, I'm uh, nowhere one, near talented enough to. to one remember. site is Cal Sky is uh, is one that's been doing that for. It'll, it'll show you the path nearby. And we've even done that during partial lunar eclipses to try to uh, see if there was, if you could get an ISS wow. transit during an eclipse uh, <laughs> or a partial solar, partial lunar. Uh, Thierry Legault is an amateur astronomer that will, uh, he'll, he'll travel out to like the desert in Oman just to get uh, ISS transiting during a partial solar eclipse. Okay. Or uh, there, there is an app I think now too called, I, I wanna say it's called ISS Transit Finder that will do, it'll even set up and tell, it'll give you an alert if you have one like in 24 hours, it will say, it'll, it'll send you an alert message saying you have a ISS transiting the moon uh, tomorrow or something, something like that. Yeah, that, I know the websites, but yeah, I probably, I lose track of it after a week because these things are actually pretty rare to, to come by for any given location. And generally oh, yeah. you, you should have to expect to travel at least 150 miles to find it unless you get lucky. And any, anytime I talk to people about like the different websites for tracking, somebody will pull up one that I had never heard of that is like, oh, have you ever seen? We did a whole list of, uh, and it's, that's the trick when you write in, in the first book, when you write in like, here's all the astronomical resources for web pages in a couple of years, those all go kind of uh, out of date. But uh, we try to put in, I kind of basically used, okay, what apps are I, am I always looking at or satellites or finding comets or like brightness of asteroids or things like that. So I, I basically made a whole laundry list of here's all the apps and websites that I'm looking for to get information pushed toward me. Like, uh, like the Cobbs Comet Database is a good one for um, what are comets because planetarium programs actually do a terrible job sometimes of telling you the, the current magnitude of a comet. Um, whereas these websites like, uh, like uh, the Cobbs database will actually be gathering things off what observers are seeing in observer reports in comet messaging boards and things. And then it will, it'll be a little more accurate than what, say, Starry Night will tell you uh, for a brightness of a new comet or things like that. We're due for a new comet. <laughs> I just put my own... Uh, I yeah, I've argued for that several times before, and I think usually right after I say we're about due for a comet, it's right about the time it falls apart. So I'm I'm just gonna quit. We, what's I, weird I, in, tw in I 2020? I saw a hail pop. I was happy. Yep. It's, yeah, I, I remember. I, I wish I had had a pair of binoculars or a small telescope back then. Um, but you know. Yeah, I, I remember Hayaku. Well, what was so weird is I actually enjoyed Hayakutaki 
uh, which came just a few months prior. Uh, Hail Bop was cool too, but Hayu Kotaki just came out of nowhere and it was a brilliant comet. That's like something you hear about in like from the 19th, 18th century and stuff. So that's the last time we've had one. So it can happen. So, and it's weird, that was right as uh, digital photography was kind of starting to creep in over film photography. We haven't had a, a good Northern Hemisphere comet since digital astrophotography has been uh, and, and dominated the field. And there, are no, and there have been no miracles since between the invention of the camera and Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> all right, great. Uh, so this is all fantastic. Anybody else have a comments or questions a uh, reminiscence to thoughts. i just say with comets Cobbs is definitely the first place i go when i hear because yep. you get observational data from actual people that have seen it and you see what magnitude's at and you go well yeah i'm not going to try tonight <laughs> i'll wait for it to get a little brighter i, I think coy is still on the quest for his uh 100 for the gold level uh comet viewing through al too yeah much, i'm yeah, I'm working yeah. on silver yeah i've, silver, I've finished okay. the first i finished the first level whatever that is i'm i'm on second level now for usually every morning i'm looking through the cbat circular list to see if there's any new discoveries because <laughs> that's usually where they'll pop up first and of course i'm on all the the yahoo message boards like the comet and minor planet lists they'll usually start being chatter there if it's a comet that's of note um and then once I see there's a new comet, if I plug in the name in the uh, JPL, uh, their eph ephemeris generator, where it generates the orbit, then if I see where the orbit's going, that's usually can, can tell me that. Like when we had Oumuamua a couple years ago, um, I looked at that orbit and I'm kind of like, that's not a usual parabolic orbit. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, it, it has the, it, I, that was the first time that that tipped me off that there's something not quite right about this object. <laughs> that, that was an interesting morning when that came out. Okay. And I was there when Comet Ison did it. I, I had just started writing for Universe Today when, when Comet Ison was uh, fizzled on us. So I remember that Thanksgiving 2013, I think it was. Yeah, we're just, it, it's been a long series of bad luck, but I was reading the, the Sky and Telescope from uh, this month, or July, yeah. excuse me, was talking about the long sort of history of comets that sort of disappointed and, yeah. Yeah, there, there was, Kohotek was a disappointment. Uh, Ison is the only one most of us remember. Kohotek, I was just a kid then. Um, but I, I remember last year, uh, the, the T-42 was supposed to be really good, and that fell apart. And then the, this year, we had three comets in a row fall apart. Y-4 Atlas, yeah, it was, uh, yeah. yeah. It's, what you, it's weird, like I said, we have a good string of about half a dozen binocular comets. T-2 Panstars has been pretty, and it's well-placed for Northern observers, but it's, uh, it's in Ursa Major right now. Uh, it passed by a bunch of deep sky objects, but it's seventh, eighth magnitude, but it's... But, uh, yeah, and I've, tr I've seen it a few times, and it doesn't say it, it's a very diffuse comet and doesn't seem to have much of a tail, at least visually. Um, yeah. It's, it, it's bright enough to see um, compared to, you can tell it's not nothing, um, yeah. but that, that's about it. Um, I haven't gone out there with a, uh, the, uh, a big telescope, not since it got closer. I think I was looking at it back in December. Um, both both Hale Bop and Hayukutaki went circumpolar, if I remember too. So that was really a treat for northern observers. And you kind of had a good study of Hayukutaki was a small comet up close, so it was brilliant. Hale Bop was a large comet, but it was far away. Had Hale Bop come by six months earlier or later, we would have had an amazing comet because it we it was that good, and it was on the far side of our orbit that we saw it. So. Yeah, I distinctly remember I was up in the the in college at the time, and it was a rather remote location. And uh, the walking to and from the, the the library every night it was a, a brilliant sight. Um, yeah, it was one you could just look. It looked like a, a comet. It had the tails. And I remember uh, stopping by a highway in Alaska and just showing a friend of mine. He's like, "It's right there. You can see it." It's like, yeah, I must yeah. ran off the road one time looking at. It. <laughs> well, I remember it was a long interstate trip that I took, and I, you could see it right up there with the with traffic lights, headlights. It was on beautiful display. 
but you know, you, uh, when I've written about it and wanted to include pictures, you see this, this lot of where it started just before digital astrophotography came on. There's not a lot of really amazing immature photos uh, because it, it was in that film era where a lot of them just haven't been digitized. There are some, but it's not like if a bright comet were to come by now, there would be just thousands of photos of it because everybody would be out shooting. You know, so. so what was that? That, that comment, there the the comic from Matt Immelman last year for the the eclipse, where you just get barraged by shots of the the lunar eclipse. Yeah, same thing with a comet if we get a good one. Oh yeah, yeah, we got another good eclipse coming twenty twenty four too. So that's yep. uh, that'll that's that scary. misses you guys, I think. Uh, uh, but it's like Texas up through Maine. Yeah, it, it's I'm, close enough that everybody wants to go to Dallas. Everybody, and everybody knows they they. They shouldn't go to Dallas because everybody's going to Dallas. Um, I've got about 50 or 60 relations living right along the path. So everybody's going to go to John's family's house and that'll, that'll be that'll do it for us. So. I'm torn right. because it goes over my hometown of, of uh, northern Maine and Mapleton, Maine. But that's probably weather-wise the worst place to be in April. <laughs> so uh, the, the best place is down in Mexico. All the hardcore eclipse chasers I know are going to go down there. Well, so. the... I think the absolute worst place to catch an eclipse is going to be wherever I end up going. Um, but, <laughs> but that's just my poor luck. I, I made it all the way out to totality last time, and I was foiled by a very thick cloud at the last minute. Where, where uh, were you? I was in Nashville. Um, okay, I, I got, so, I got, cl I got, I got clouded out at totality too. I was at the uh, the Perry Radio Telescope Observatory and in the Smoky Mountains in North Carolina. So I wasn't far away from you. Yeah. No, it, it was a beautiful shot. And I had probably for the area, the most, the longest period of time of totality, but there was just this one big thick juicy cloud and an otherwise blue sky <laughs> oh, that wow. came over. Like I've got one picture of totality, which is just like half of the Corona and the rest of it is covered by Okay, cloud. so you did see some of it. So I yeah, caught I, some of it, you know, as a picture, but yeah, not visual. I, I we lost, uh, I have a, I, I look back through the timestamps on the images and we lost the sun at 30 seconds prior to totality. <laughs> it's the last photo. That I, I had a press invite there and I knew it was hubris to kind of tempt <laughs> going to somewhere called the Smoky Mountains for an eclipse. But I was like, okay, it's a nice location and it was a fun event. And we saw it got dark. The mosquitoes came out. You had the 360 degree sunset. And, yeah, uh, I've, I've, I've got all I, the, the other shots and I watched the birds lose their minds and I watched the sky yeah. turn purple right beforehand and you could taste the air. And yeah, it was it was all the other effects are pretty cool. But yeah, now um, I have a reason I didn't to, go get to, to see the hole in the sun. I have the reason to go to the 2020. We both have a reason to go to the 2024 eclipse. Then. Oh yeah. Yeah. I almost went to, I got so upset that right after the, the 2017, I swore I was going to Chile just to, to, for the next one. But, uh, luckily I, I talked wanna, myself out of it. I don't want to, uh, pop anybody's bubble, but I've got John and Beth's extra bedroom already reserved for April the 8th, 2024, because that's Diane's and my birth, uh, anniversary. Okay. So, we're going to see the uh, comet on our anniversary, all the eclipse. So, yeah. Well, I've got a brother that lives in uh, a, a couple of miles off of the center line. Um, so even though he and I are at odds, my father has assured me he's going to talk to him um, by, the, by the time the eclipse comes around. So I may have to, to either buy candy for his son beforehand to, to nag him or you know, yeah. I'll, I'll Four fun. years of sucking up to do, Scott. Oh, I'm I'm not gonna do that. But yeah, I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll definitely bribe whatever it takes. Child. I have no I have no compunctions about bribing children. That that's <laughs> that's always the big debate: is the center line or the grays line? Because it's like the center line, you get the longer uh, totality, but the grays line, you get all the Bailey's beads and all the kind of. Uh, there's some guys I know, eclipse chasers. They deliberately go for the grays line. Well, I, I I'm desperate for totality at this point yeah, I, I can, I can live without that yeah it's, 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 give myself the absolute best chance that I've got <laughs> okay cool. uh, so it's been absolutely lovely lovely speaking with you and thank you very much yeah, yeah. for coming to join us thank uh, you. we've got a little bit of club business that we need to, to take care of right quick uh, so if you want to go on uh, we'll dismiss you with our with our greatest thanks and, I uh, think I will, but it's, it's been good talking to you guys. And, and I'll, I'll go ahead and let, give you the last word here for valedictions. Yeah. 
No, it's uh, it's been good talking to you guys, and thanks for having me on on for the meeting. So, all right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Be well.